my interview, Inge. Take one. Inge, welcome. Thank you for being here. There's, there's so much to talk about and you have so much uh, to share with us. Maybe let's start, you know, what brought you to sailing in the first place? First of all, thank you. I'm really honored that you've invited me. Um, as you know, I love the club, so this is a really fun project. What brought me here? Um, a Star Ferry ride. I met my boyfriend on the Star Ferry and he took me to the Yacht Club and I started up as the bikini-clad girlfriend on the back of a big boat. And you ended up with a, a fantastic uh, Burgie as Commodore in 2004. Tell us all about that journey to become a Commodore and the first female Commodore of the club. Oh, that was... Um uh, unintended all of it I think but um, uh, I loved sailing I took to it like a fish takes to water I guess and uh, I uh, started off first uh, volunteering for all the harbor races so I started on the foredeck as one usually did on uh, on a ruffian and then impala and uh, then I had a flying 15 and then I think my boyfriend and his team discovered me and so I started sailing on big boats did that for quite a few years uh, we did together big international events we had, went to uh, Kenwood Cup we went SORC in Florida um, Kings Cup uh, Commodore's Cup uh, Kila Week you know so and then all the local racing and I really enjoyed it we had uh, some really good campaigns with a lot of um, of professional we always went half friends half professionals and we learned a lot but there came a time when I felt chauffeur driven around the course. That's yeah, a very important point for you, right? That's so, very important. So how did you me. manage to get out of there? Well, I found a, a 33 footer and it was a X99. I ended up calling her Fox and Socks. <laughs> and I basically bought her because I thought I knew how hard it was for a girl to get onto a bigger boat and actually be on a competitive uh, race mm -hmm. like Kenwood, for example. We were two girls, but that was mainly me pushing it, right? Uh, and so I did that. I think I had the all girls for maybe two years. Late, Na late 90s? It was the late, late 90s, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And uh, we did that for two years. Then we had ha had mixed teams, which was uh, was fun, and we were a little bit more competitive. Uh, it was brain and muscles, so that was pretty good. <laughs> and then my last few years, I raced with um, with a group of young French-speaking gentlemen, and you, you were that. one of them. <laughs> And by then, I think we dominated uh, Class B for about two or three years. But then you translated a bit that Tracy Edward-esque uh, attitude also into the club and, and, and your role in, in, in the committees and, and, and going to become uh, eventually Commodore in 2004, 2006. I think I committed without knowing what I committed to because um, the sailing committee at the time wanted to have a female chairman for the at that time quorum cup mm -hmm. and I think it was the second quorum cup so uh, I said okay then and then the next question was oh but then you should really sit on GenCom and I thought oh, I can do a year okay then <laughs> and that was the beginning and uh, from there on I it led to doing all kinds first facilities committee shelter to cove committee uh, planning and works committee and i don't know lots uh, and i just really enjoyed it and i could see if no one wanted to make a decision i would just make it mm -hmm. and i think being prepared going into a meeting knowing exactly what you want to achieve not saying that you are stubborn because sometimes I would change my mind if I had really good arguments. Um, and so I think that's another skill, maybe leadership, that needs to be there to get in. And um, and then I think commodoreship was never really a goal, because that was not really attainable, I think. But um, it just happened. It just and, happened. Uh, and it was a time where a lot of things were happening in Hong Kong. The club was changing. Yeah. Hong Kong was changing. And I, I remember you sharing a story with me about, you know, the story about the bypass. 
but at one stage it was not at all the plan, right? It, it, the Tell plan, us a bit about the that. The plan actually was that the uh, one chai one chai bypass uh, was meant to be on uh, an extension of the eastern corridor. So uh, a bridge, right? Uh, like extension of a bridge <laughs> with the pillars going through our swimming pool. And <laughs> and if you have a look at the uh, the reception has a funny shape and that's basically because it was built that building was built to fit that plan that never oh, materialized. Really? So that's why it's got this scalloping it's why they have a bit, these, right? Yes. So uh, the club uh, and uh, a group of really interested uh, people in that Lowell was part of that as yep. well. Uh, we um, hired some consultant on pub public relations so that the club learned how to become part of the community, but also trying to represent our interests mm. and uh, the club's interests. And so we went to all the town hall meetings there were in regards to it. And uh, we came up with pictures of the big dick in, I think in Canada, where, where they were actually knocking down bridges so it wouldn't be a good choice and uh, we we were of course opting for the horizontal directional horizontal drilling system that would bring the tunnels underneath the club and uh, to achieve that we we appointed members to come for the town hall meetings and we would make sure every uh, discussion groups had at least one or two of the members mm -hmm. and uh, surprise surprise all the groups came back and said oh it must be a tunnel that is the only way forward well that's <laughs> so, fantastic yeah, thank, that's, thank yeah. you and others for that because <laughs> you also oversaw um, a transition from you know, a, a club which was a place where people gathered, still do, to partake in their sports, to... We called it uh, the Sailors and Boozers. <laughs> <laughs> the Sailors and Boozers. Sorry. To a place where we're a bit more encompassing, mm. but also a bit more competitive with other uh, club facilities in the world, mm -hmm. uh, and especially in Hong Kong, which is, a, as you know, a very modern and dynamic place. So so how was that? I mean, you were telling me the, the compass room was nearly a, a more... Ref you know, a, a canteen that it was a... Pale green with two concrete steps down and uh, not much else. Um, and uh, so I think the first refurbishment was in 1979. So, and then uh, we had another refurbishment in 2000, we finished actually. And that refurbishment was based on the 70s refurbishment because as people congratulating us on having a traditional club and where we've respected all the the old uh, features and things, that's actually not the case because we started off with blue Pirelli flooring in the bar uh, and a bar that where the staff could barely come around the the columns. Uh, we had. Um, uh, we had green and orange tiles. All our windows were aluminium sliding doors. Um, so it, it was a very different picture. So I think uh, in, in the group we were sitting to uh, develop the, the brand Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club, we had basically three, three designs in mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first design was, of course, the the traditional English club, which is more the upper level and the chart room and compass room that we are seeing now. And more then woody, uh, woody and brass, brass and, and leather, and, leather like. and and louvers and things. Mm. Then we had the main bar, which was more of. Um, um, it was more of a, the J boat era, mm -hmm. which had the slotted wall paneling and mm -hmm. and it was classy but still very woody. Mm -hmm. And the last uh, type we were looking at was more still nautical, but the modern functional uh, in lighter colored wood for the changing rooms and for all our sports facilities and all of that. We had the old bowling bar and I think even now the new bowling uh, bowling uh, area is similar as well. Yeah, more mm. pastel more resorty. Uh, yeah. yeah, but I think the main change was to be from is pure sailors club it has become a lifestyle club where families uh, have uh, have a, uh, a grounding in it uh, our whole paddling site i think and rowing site has expanded tremendously i think when i was commodore we had 
131 members and I think that has changed a lot uh, what I can see. Oh absolutely yeah. I mean uh, as you know I mean we'll have fellow rowers and, uh, and paddlers here but really there's been an impetus through rowing and paddling uh, also new sports right? But also interacting with the new sport mm -hmm. uh, because uh, when we were doing, um, there was a time when uh, government was considering moving the club. That was even earlier, that was mid 90s. Yep. And That's what my questions for Lowell. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, my point on it, we were looking at, we were looking at staging the harbour uh, to be uh, interaction with the community. So, we had meetings like with the uh, One Chai District Council, the North Point District Council, and we're trying to integrate and say, look, we're doing it, we want to be part of the community. And I think having now paddlers, having events uh, like around the island, right, is ama race is am amazing. No, you're you're absolutely yeah. right. This, this, this idea of reaching out and being yes. part of the community, it, it's something that we presented to the ICOYC recently yeah. at their conference. I just touch on the ICOYC. I mean, you've had a a very important role in uh, in setting up. Can you tell us a bit what the ICOYC and how it impacts our club? It's uh, the uh, International Council of Your Clubs. Uh, Basically, I got invited to go to the Royal Van, Vancouver Your Club. Uh, it, at, uh, the invitees were uh, one American Your Club, a few Canadians, one British Your Club and Hong Kong. And so we went there and we spent a week and it was really, I thought the interchange was really good. Uh, seeing that clubs uh, have the same problems uh, and of course with the uh, being bigger and more self-sufficient now, uh, there are a lot of common ground. Sharing uh, experiences and interaction is really good. Uh, so I, uh, I came back from Canada and went to the general committee and said, look, I think we should have a Commodore's Forum, it was called at the time, uh, for as many as we co uh, can, can invite. And I think we had close to 40 clubs uh, invited. And in that forum, we basically founded the International Council of Your Clubs. Since then, Hong Kong has had it twice. And they are now trying, or they, the group is trying to send it to different parts of the world. So we will probably not get it again for a little while. Uh, but it's, uh, yeah, I'm still sitting on as a chairman for the forum advisory committee and I'm still representing the Yacht Club as board of director. So you, you, you never stop. I mean, the design of the club, you, you, you've, you've served the club in numerous committees, culminating as, as Commodore in 2004. But there's one which is very close to your heart, which is uh, volunteering. What, what do you like about being an RO and, 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 and a pretty uh, experienced one? I mean, you mentioned something about if you make a mistake on a boat, oh. just the boat sees it. I always say when, <laughs> when, when you make a mistake on your own, own boat, your team knows about it. But when, as a race officer, the entire fleet and the tongues will be lashing. We know that already. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, as I mentioned, I got conned into it uh, via the Cor Quorum Cup in 19... 96 and then on and off uh, I've done a little bit of uh, race management but then I think in 2007 or so we sold our last sailboat and uh, I've then been doing a lot of race management and I do it not only for the York Club uh, I do it for HKSF uh, where I also have been a board of director for been on the board of directorship for a few years and I do it for ABC, I do it for Hebe, uh, I do it for Hobby Clubs, anyone who needs and I think uh, under the tutelage of Lucy I think we've built a really good race management here at the club and we are lending our help to all of Hong Kong's races so I think it's been a very successful uh, thing and for me personally i I love the strategy of it. It's about uh, knowing the types of boats, the speed, sending them on courses, knowing what they can do, the wind conditions, and then get them all together is really together, finishing at the same time. I mean, that would be the best. Or when the wind dies, knowing when to shorten. So to me, it's really fun. I, I really enjoy that. Any, any little anecdotes? 
lots of those, but one that's still, two actually, that still stands out is uh, where the committee board gets hit. Yeah. And the first one was a 55-footer that hit us in 26 knots uh, uh, just uh, south of Potoys. And it was, as uh, said, blowing a hoolie. And uh, they hit us full on the side. And later on, they were telling us it was either dead uh, doing that or, or losing a leg. So um, losing a leg of one of the yeah, teammates. Yeah, the, the people sitting but, on the rail. Uh, mm. But it is, so we just checked that everything was okay. We finished the last start, and then we had two trolleys bring us back to Kellett because the steering had gone. So, you know, <laughs> we needed to go to starboard. We had one trolley pulling the other. Pull. So we made it back after an hour and a bit. And the other one being hit was, we had the Volvo, right. yes, so we got hit by, by the Chinese boat. And I thought that was amazing because everything seemed to be so professional. Right? So you got a 65-foot <laughs> VOR like hit, yes. <laughs> down on you. But then minding you, putting uh, these small courses in right. the harbor, that was just a show. But the Chinese boat show. was Dongfeng, and Dongfeng yeah. were all French yeah. people. And you yeah. have this attraction to French-speaking people. So <laughs> obviously we they were coming home to <laughs> roost, right? What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> You touched a bit earlier also on uh, on, on your, your vast experience. I mean, you, you mentioned you have done 30 China Sea races, or you've got quite a number of yeah. offshore races you've yeah. done. China Sea crossings, whether it's San Fernando, whether it's China Sea race, or uh, going to uh, down to, uh, to Palawan. Or right. It's I love it. I love being out. Once you're gone, no one can get you. And uh, if you have a good team, you really go into into the space. Mm. And uh, for me, uh, I've, I've done a lot of uh, helming, navigation. I've done that for the last 15 years. And I've been the official radio operator so you might have heard uh, yeah oh, i have i have i remember going down <laughs> and being steering and uh, it's middle of the night and there's a, the, the 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 report and you're the relay and then yeah. you you know you're you're very calm and yeah. very eloquent and, yeah. uh, well um, ah, it's you know oh in goes around so everything's fine i think in 30 knots when you're bracing with your legs to make sure you don't fall over and the bucket close because it's not all happy sailing in that condition but you have to do it right so yeah no that was uh, yeah. that, that's fantastic I, I especially remember commodore's cup 2008 yes in cows yes we that were there was, with uh, a three boat team we had three boat team yeah. uh, and uh, also very windy conditions really 30 35 knots yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the tide, the tide was amazing i mean uh, we had local uh, local had help fantastic for, for, local knowledge yeah, yeah. so that yeah. was good um, but I mean, you had to go up two miles in order to uh, go just over there to a mark. So it was a bit of an eye opener. Now, now going back a bit to the club. I mean, uh, what do you feel is so special about this club? What, what you, in your own words, you know? Um, my, all my friends are here. Yeah. I want to retire in Hong Kong and I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. The club is such a, a substantial part of uh, both mine and Rick's life. Mm. And um, we might not go racing right now. We've, you know, changed horses for courses. So we have now a wooden junk that we pour all our love into. Um, because uh, she's just in Aberdeen now and uh, the planks that get replaced is amazing, actually. <laughs> but it's all good fun and it's history. Again, it's history uh, brought forward. And uh, I must say my love of sailing has also in my business life mm. brought me into doing more than uh, both interiors and some serious part commissioning of, right there was that amazing yeah. 90 foot trimaran right? yeah, yeah, 100 and 140 foot 140 foot right it was built uh, in mcconaughey uh, or carbon, built in right? mcconaughey took four years uh, still i mean i will never get it an amazing job like that again it's, it's just uh, an amazing boat to start off amazing with, right? boat uh, but that's the modern version of it. Then there's still the Wai Fung, which is, a, is an icon of boats. It's the old Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank uh, boat where they were building, uh, burning the, the money, the paper money, uh, while they were eating curry and things. And that is from 1930s, so I've been involved. And uh, she's today, I think, for charter. Mm -hmm. And I did her sister ship, which is a 54-foot. Uh, wai Fung is a 70-foot and quite a few junks I've done. So it's all love that turns into 
and it's what you do. And, and, and this, this design, this continuous uh, involvement, I mean, it, it's not stopping, right? We're all very proud of the, the amount of energy and work that mm. you have, pro bono, I might add, um, done to, uh, to the club. I think, um, well, as Commodore, probably also one of the youngest. I was 47 when I... I did it, so that's uh, just a couple of years ago. Have, have more have more energy than now, uh, but just to come back also to you said what I really love about the club, having represented uh, the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club in in the International Council of Yacht Clubs. Um, we had a good chance of comparing ourselves to the rest of the world, and I think uh, we are by far the largest club in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, we have uh, most outlets, we have most activities. I mean, we are superlative against even the big American clubs. So I think that's something we can be proud of because um, the club is built up of um, a cultural mix. Uh, we have, for example, I think 48 different nationalities. 54 we, now. Now it's 54, there you go. Which is even better, right? Which I think is really amazing. and. Uh, uh, it, it makes for this really good atmosphere in, in no, the you, you, You're right, it is today, it, it is a lot more homogeneous in terms of the nationalities that we have. Mm. It, it's, it, and that's what's great. We are truly worldly mm. in, in that respect, which uh, makes it good. for a very unique, yeah. unique place. So unique that I'm sure that you've accumulated a number of special memories over the years. Any any that you'd like to share with us that you well i mean well, the some that you can <laughs> share with us uh, i mean one of the one everyone talks about is the bell climbing in the bar and that mm-hmm. usually happens after the nations cup or some uh, uh, the spring regatta or some of the big events and uh, i mean we we often had also when we had international visitors so we sent someone around the bell and they said oh this is easy and we conned them in to go around and it wasn't so easy uh, but I remember one that stands out where there was a challenge, uh, girls against boys, and it was five climbs on either side. And we had reinforcement from our wing and kit in the bar. They must have practiced secretly, I think. <laughs> but uh, so the girls won uh, five t- against three. So we're quite proud of that. <laughs> and anyone interested right now, the mm-hmm. record stands at 7.8 seconds. So and who is that? Red Maynard, think, right? I, no, 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 no. Uh, young Maynard. Oh, yeah. when he was young, Mr. Yeah. Maynard. Yeah. Uh, no, it's uh, young um, Nikolai Jakobsen. Oh, managed, well uh, done. Yeah, so it's there, uh, moved on. Very good. It took good. me an hour and a half to do it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Yeah. You, you mentioned also... Um, some uh, Frenchman dipping overboard? And, uh... Oh, well, that's probably where my claim to fame comes in. <laughs> when I had, uh, had my all French-speaking crew, that was Swiss, uh, French and Belgium, I think, that's all right. of it, <laughs> um, uh, we were going out in the spring and a uh, wrap of, uh, of the spinnaker sheet around the prop is, of course, loss of face. But then, so two of the young guys, they jumped in and they came, unwrapped it, came back up, but didn't have the baby suit on so they were standing there leaning on the boom drying off in their white undies and uh, <laughs> the tongue lashing I got for months after that is, is just one of them. <laughs> Frenchman can, can drying just, up on the th- please by all means. Can I just uh, combine, uh, combine uh, design with the uh, entertainment in the club uh, just recently um, I saw I I didn't partake this time but I could see the carpet we chose for the staircase is excellent for mm. tray sliding <laughs> it is those are important traditions that it's, need to be maintained yes, whilst yes. whilst we move on and we adapt there are yeah. certain things like yeah. bell climbing like the trace lighting yeah. um, that that need to be uh, maintained. We should also, you know, the the what is it the the cannon um, the cannon carry hasn't been done for quite some time. Um, so those those are things that make our club very special, and that's why you know I've asked yourself and others to to bring to this new room a piece of memento. Mm-hmm. I um, I would bring a picture that I'm quite proud of where I represented the Yokla mm-hmm. and together with Phyllis we were, I think it was a dragon event and we had Prince Henrik of Denmark so you know as a, a little butcher's daughter from a village uh, down south in Denmark that was, was um, a proud moment for me. What do you see in store for the club in the future? What, what, what should we be looking to? 
I think the, we are already in the future. Uh, the club has changed tremendously. Uh, we uh, have um, our uh, uh, demographics has changed. Uh, when I first joined, we were 15% local Chinese, the rest were expats. Now we are 60% uh, uh, local and uh, still 40% from 54 nations. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I think our requirements have changed. We need to go with it. Our membership now gets older and stays members until they die, where before they might have left mm -hmm. and the turnover was bigger. Um, we already mentioned that children have become more an integral part. You know, dads don't go off and sail anymore. Mm -hmm. It's now a family affair. Um, I think uh, again, most important, we need to stay in touch with the uh, with the community around yeah. us, because um, we need to be part of it. We are sitting on a historical piece of land here, and we need to share it with as many as we can. And I think we are trying. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I I know many people who've been sailing out of here without being members for years and years and then finally they joined when they could afford it and I think that's something we need to look at how can we make the club also affordable so that uh, anyone who really loves the sport has a chance to, yeah. to join it. Wise words, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.